Hey folks, I'm Gene Della Sala, president of Audioholics, and today I'd like to do a follow-up video on the AV receiver power ratings game. I think um, we have a new trend that we're seeing now with some of these Atmos receivers that we need to discuss, and it's how they're rating power, and it's they're really inflating it beyond what we ever thought would happen even a year ago. So before we get into that topic, I think it's important to go over uh, the power versus distortion curves that you always see. You see it on our site, you see it on some of the magazines. And I'd like to explain a little bit about what this, what these numbers mean and, and what the graph means. So if we look at this Class A amplifier that I reviewed a couple of years ago, it's a CT2300, 300 watt RMS rated amplifier. If you look at the measurement I ran on this at one kilohertz with both channels driven, you could see the horizontal line from you know below 160 watts all the way past 300 maybe to about 340 watts you see how that line is all horizontal that means that that amplifier is, is running in a very linear uh, region it's not distorting it's not clipping the distortion is below 0 0.005 all the way up to about 340 watts and then you see it just goes sh almost straight up vertically at that point where it goes from horizontal to vertical is called the knee of the line or the knee of the graph. And that's basically the point where the amplifier is running out of usable voltage. Okay, that means that you're, you're heading into clipping. As you get up that line, you get into more and more distortion. And as you go to the right of that vertical line, that's all distortion. So you went from a linear operating region at the horizontal area where your noise is your dominant factor, which is really low on a good amplifier like this, to once you get to that knee and it starts going vertical and beyond that, that's all distortion. Your amplifier is now in a distortion region. And years ago, a lot of the amplifier companies, even the receiver companies were very conservative. They would give you the power rating in the horizontal region before it went to the knee. So in this case, they would call this a 300 watt amplifier, which is what class A does to their, you know, to commend them. This is a 300 watt amplifier, but in reality, they could have rated this a 340, 350 watt amplifier and gotten away with it. Because you could see on the graph that I have here, at 0.1%, it's at 344 watts, and at 1%, it's at 357 watts. 1% is pretty much you're into the clipping region. 0.1%, even though you don't see clipping on an oscilloscope, you do start seeing some really nasty harmonics. Like if you did an FFT spectrum, you would see at the one kilohertz primary, um, wavefront you would see a bunch of harmonic distortion past that now it's debatable at to what level you would hear the distortion but let's be real guys let's try to rate things conservatively and and try to give honest values to power amplifiers i really like what class a did by calling this a 300 watt amplifier i would call it a 340 or 350 watt amplifier i wouldn't lose any sleep over it but now here's the problem when you look at and I'm not trying to single anyone out. I'm just using these as examples. Let's look at the Denon that I reviewed a while back. This is the Denon 5200 amplifier or the AV receiver. And it's rated at 140 watts, I believe. And you can see the sweep that I ran on this. And you can see the knee of that curve is really starting to get up there below 140 watts. I mean, they're rating this at 140 watts a channel. That's at 0.1%, you know, um, a little wiggle room there. In reality, if they were more like Class A or more like some of the more conservative brands like NAD, um, they would have called this a 100 watt receiver. And that's why you see companies like NAD, you look at their amplifiers, uh, their receivers, and they're rated at 70 or 80 watts a channel. They do it all channels driven. And it, you look at it, it's like not that impressive because you got your competitor rating it at 200 watts and your competitor might weigh the same or less than the NAD. So now you think you're getting robbed with NAD. But I'm just trying to tell you guys that we're not looking at apples to apples. You got to be really careful with how you look at the manufacturer specs. So in the case with the Denon over here, you can see the knee goes straight up. It's, a, it's definitely a much harder clipped amplifier than what you saw with the Class A. And it makes sense because you're, you're dealing with a smaller power supply with multiple channels. In this case, it's like seven channels. So you don't have as much heat sinking area. You don't have as much um, thermal dissipation. You don't have as beefy of, of uh, transistors. You don't have as big of a power supply. So obviously, you can't expect a seven channel receiver to give out that kind of power. Now, in this case, even though they rated at 140 watts, Denon claims it's only one or two, or I think it says it's two channels driven because they do it the FTC uh, rated 
method for two channels driven. And I think I tested it with seven channels driven and maybe I like 70 watts. So um, just realize that you're not getting apples to apples unless you really know how things are being rated. Now, what I have a bone to pick is what I found recently is you look at Ankyo's website and you look at Pioneer's website. Now, Ankyo, Pioneer, and Integra are sharing the exact, virtually the exact same power sections of all three receivers of their flagships. Ever since, um, ever since Ankyo bought out Pioneer, they're kind of exchanging technology. So you're really getting a very similar receiver. You're just getting some different DSP features between the three to distinguish them. But they all use the same D3 um, digital module for the amplification. And I believe they use pretty much the same power supply too. So look at this Ankyo, the TXRZ3100. When I saw this initially, when we did our preview article and it said 200 watts at six ohms, one kilohertz, 0.9% one channel driven, that kind of pissed me off. Because not only are they manipulating with one channel driven, but they're giving you a rating virtually at clipping, like at one, it's, let's just call it 1%, 0 0.9 is freaking 1%, okay? But they're also manipulating the impedance. They're using six ohms to make the amplifier look more powerful than it is because it's drawn more current with one channel driven and it's rating that power up higher. So if you want to do a little math, guys, I know some people are shy with math, but this is really basic stuff. If you want to do a little math, you've got power equals voltage times current and use Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance. If you do a substitution, then you could find voltage, which is the square root of power times resistance. So in the case of a 200 watt rating that Akio is giving you at six ohms, that's 34.6 volts RMS, okay? Now, if you want to see what that power is at an eight ohm load, which is how most amplifiers are, are rated, let's look at it, guys. If you look at most amplifiers online or in the specs, they rate it at eight ohms and four ohms, not six ohms, okay? That's just trickery, in my opinion. So you take that 34.6 volts into eight ohm load. Now you're looking at 150 watts, okay? But again, they're doing it at that clipping point. So let's be a little bit more conservative and derate that a little bit. And you'll see that that 200 watt receiver is now really only 140 watts. And if you go on Integra's website for the same receiver, they rate it at 140 watts. And now Akio has recently updated their website to show you the, four, the 140 watt rating for two channels driven at eight ohms. So I don't know if they just recently did that because we bitched about it at Cedia, but it wasn't there. Um, a month or two ago that I could see. So again, just realize that this is a BS rating. When you see the six ohm, one channel driven, I really don't, especially don't like the one channel driven. We should at least have a two channel rating um, to pay homage to the old days of stereo because let's, let's face it, at the very minimum, when you're running a system, you're gonna run at least stereo front speakers, right? Most of your power draw is gonna be from the stereo front speakers, especially if you're running them full range. So we should have an honest, disclosure of two channels driven. I like to do full bandwidth. What I like to do is I typically sweep, I find the, the point at one kilohertz at 0.1% distortion, and I sweep from 20 to 20 kilohertz because at low frequencies, bass uses a lot of energy because it's very long duty cycles. You can start seeing problems if you don't have an adequate enough power supply. When you have a long sustained bass note, that voltage will sag and you won't be able to maintain the power. Now at high frequencies, that's another problem, especially with these digital amps. Years ago, Pioneer used this ICE module and because of restrictions of the output filter, they would collapse at three kilohertz, above three kilohertz in a forum load. Now all the magazines missed this, of course, because everybody tests only at one kilohertz. So they were all declaring, oh my God, the Pioneer is the most powerful receiver on the market. It's putting out all channels driven at 140 watts or whatever the hell the number was but they failed to mention the fact they only tested at one kilohertz. And then we, of course, disclosed this when we did the measurements in our review, and we took a lot of heat on the websites, on ABS forum and stuff, because they thought we weren't being fair to class D amplifiers, which is a bunch of BS, because why wouldn't you apply the same rules regardless of the topology? You still wanna know what kind of power you drive. We found out years later that a lot of those units were having problems in the field with forum speakers. Now, Pioneer doesn't use the ICE module anymore. They use their D3 module, which I have yet to test. So I have yet to verify what it does when at four ohms at above a couple of kilohertz. But we will get one in soon, guys. Whether it's the Integra one or the Ankyo or the Pioneer, we'll figure out what it's doing at four ohms. But the point of the matter is, learn how specmanship is done. 
okay? Otherwise, you're going to think one product is more powerful than the other when necessarily it may not be. There might be the same power. It might be less. It's all specmanship, guys. And it's really important that you become educated as a consumer when you're picking a, a receiver and you really want to know what kind of power you're getting into. And if you don't think you have enough power, make sure you choose a model that has preamp outputs on it because then later on, you could go and add external amplification, at least for the front channels or maybe the LCRs. And then you'll take some of that uh, strain off the receiver because let's face it, that receiver is really, it's doing a lot. It's a workhorse. It's driving seven, sometimes 11 channels. Plus it's providing processing power, HDMI, DSP, all that stuff. So if you really want to slam with a lot of power, you're going to need an external amplifier. And uh, most of these receivers today will not be able to give you that kind of oomph, especially if you're running full range speakers. So keep that in mind. Um, learn your ratings and I hope you like this video. I hope it gave you some light on what's going on with the power ratings and let's keep these manufacturers honest. So give us some feedback in the video. If you like it, hit the thumb up on it. Give us your comments. Let us know what else you want to talk about. And until next time, keep listening.